what does a nil CPU mean in terms of impact to the power budget of, of a system that might implement it? The mill internally works very much like a conventional DSP. Um, we have advances on it, but in terms of where it spends its power, a very large amount of it goes into actual functional units, adders, multipliers, um, access to cash, things of that nature, the same things that a DSP does. Where our advantage is over a conventional out-of-order superscaler, the x86s and power PCs of the world, is that they actually spend rather little of their power budget on those functions. They spend nearly all of their power budget figuring out what they're going to do next, keeping track of everything, moving things around, and getting ready to do something, and then finally they do an ad. We've gotten rid of all of that. Um, as a result, our, um, while we can compare um, our projected power numbers, and these are projected, we're in SIM only, we do not actually have, have um, something that we can actually measure. Um, our projected numbers we can compare against the kind of numbers that, that currently available DSP chips have, and we scale. Um, you know, delta a few percent, but it, but uh, but it scales. But if you compare those against a, um, a conventional superscaler, um, it's ten percent of the power. Not only for us, but for Texas Instruments too. Um, so there's where the power budget difference makes. The, the architecture has eliminated the great majority of the actual power consuming parts of a conventional architecture. How do you, uh, how do you address the critics who say, well, you know, I don't need a faster CPU these days? And if you don't, then more power to you. Um, there are those people who do, and that will be certainly enough for us to have an entry into the market. Um, there's a second factor, however, when you eliminate the, all of this excess wire and storage and register and so forth, which is the power budget, that is also impacting the area budget. An adder is so small you need a microscope to see the thing. If you've got really good eyes, you can see a double precision floating point multiplier. Maybe. What is all this space? Well, a lot of it is cash, and we do use cash too. But in terms of the core proper, not only is the great majority of it, again, wires and keeping track, but not that it, what that logic is uh, impacts both the total size of the chip, but it also impacts the yield because that's the area where the alpha radiation and, and, and the minor specks of whatever it is that, that causes trouble um, have their impact. So as a result, we expect that we will be able to get some, for equal performance, we will be able to get substantially more chips off a die than a superscalar can. Well, Die area and before yield equals dollars. And consequently, the reason why somebody who, even though he does not need the higher performance of a mill, and may not even need the lower power than the mill, well, dollars matter too. Sure. Well, so, so now it's probably really early in the process to even begin to project out. But, um, you know, your standard... Uh, off-the-shelf processor today, or off-the-shelf DSP, has a host of specific interfaces. Right. Um, what are the proposed interfaces for the early okay. generation of the mill? Okay. We're a family. We're also a core company. People ask us, well, are you going to do DDR3 or DDR4? We don't care. We're not a memory vendor. Um, whatever Samsung's selling, we'll put on it. And in fact, across the family range, some will have one and some will have another, depending on the individual markets. The core essentially doesn't care. The core goes down to the controller, the controller talks to the memory. Um, if you need ECC, well that's fine, the controller has to talk ECC. But you can buy an, an, an ECC controller and just drop it on your die. And we quite possibly will. This is not where our value added is. Our value added is in the core proper, the actual execution stream. Okay, okay. So, and that, that's kind of what I was after. So, so, um, do you foresee partnering with, you know, say the likes of a TSMC 
to say, hey, look, you know, these are the peripheral. This is the standard peripheral set that uh, that mil CPU generation one we want to have on here. Um, one might include a video interface, DDR4, whatever those things are going to be. Um, do you see yourselves partnering with companies in TSMC is just an example, but do you see yourself partnering with, with IP vendors to bring that, that IP onto the die? Certainly. Okay. Um, we, we would be errantly foolish to try to do it all ourselves. Um, <laughs> but we've, we've got a value. Um, the, the, the vendors will recognize that value. They don't want to do a core. We don't want to do a memory controller. <laughs> well, some of us might want to do a memory controller, but as a business, we don't want to do memory control. Well, now memory is an interesting question, right? Great segue. Um, with respect to memory, now you've got all of this processing horsepower. What does that mean for the memory interface? How do you actually deal with, you know, I've got a processor now which is order of magnitudes faster than what it was previously. All of the existing memory architectures are built around the capacity for a processor to operate at a, at a fixed speed, that a fixed sort of known speed in that space. How do you, how do you reconcile the two? Well, partly we just tell the customer, if you want that kind of memory bandwidth, you're going to have to supply that kind of memory bandwidth. It means more pins, it, uh, it means more memory controllers, and uh, everybody knows how to do that. And uh, the fab people, well, some years back we took a proposal to Lawrence Livermore, and uh, they said, can this be built? And we had to go to, to a partner, it was LSI Logic at the time, and said, can you, can you build us a chip with 2,700 pins and they swallowed real hard and said yes so that's fine that's what those guys do sure. um, the yield will be horrible it will be incredibly expensive and some people will want it um, but as a practical matter we've attempted to address this problem from the core side as well uh, we've got a series of videos which are up on our website. Oh, I, you'll probably mention it later. Um, but the third of those videos addresses our memory interface. And one of the things that we show in that video is that, in fact, we wind up being able to have a running program doing the same work with less memory access. You might think that every time that you want to load a value that you're going to wind up having to go to memory. That's not, in fact, true. Uh, you might think that any time that you want to write a value and um, the value is not in cache to be written into, that you're going to have to pull the cache line in in order to be able to write to it. That's not true. We do not yet have numbers which will give us uh, across a big range, like a, a running operating system. We're in the process of porting an OS, but we don't have a running operating system yet. But across a big range of those loads, we don't know how big an impact that is. But back of the envelope is suggesting that the mill is going to have at least 25% fewer memory accesses for exactly the same load as for a conventional. Now, if you were to get um, a 25% higher bandwidth for free, you'd buy it, right? <laughs> well, that's what we're offering. Uh, and how all that works is explained in that video. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what are the challenges that you guys are facing right now bringing the mill to market? Like any startup, money, money, money. Um, it's, of course, it's that nature. Um, right now, our immediate thrust is that we've got over 50 patents to file. That's five zero. Um, in that kind of a volume, we're getting deals from the patent attorneys. We're, get, we're getting quotes of 10 grand a piece, which is in fact a phenomenally good price for a top flight ta patent attorney. But it's because it is in such volume that we can't. That's still a half a million bucks. Um, so that's the immediate thrust. Um, we also have to ramp up, um, replace our existing tool chain, which was pre-alpha as the best, uh, that's being polite. Uh, we've got to port an operating system. There's a whole lot of work that has to be done, uh, bringing the thing to an FPGA, which out of SIM and into actual, something real, even if it's not a commercial product. The FPGA implementation is, is a proof of principle. Not, not, a, not intended to be a commercial product. And all of this takes the same kind of time and ramp that any startup goes through. Um, people 
especially in the financial community, seem to be um, have assumed that every industry works kind of like a web startup, and that all you need is two hot guys and twenty five grand, and, and you're a billionaire in six months. Um, heavy semi doesn't work like that. Heavy semi is like steel mills and railroads. Um, by the time you can get a serious semi co company self-sustaining, you're looking at a couple of hundred million dollars of investment. That's not all at once, but it will happen. And we need to stage ourselves in such a way that the money comes in at the time when we need it so that we will, in fact, be able to get there and be self-sustaining. Well, given the, the, the more advanced capability, or sorry, more, more I don't know if I should be using advanced or more efficient, I mean, it's, you know, it's a combination of things, right? But given the better performance, um, do you find that particularly in this community where we are, around Mountain View, where you have guys like Google, you have uh, people like Cisco who have big packet switching problems or big data search problems, are constantly searching for a CPU that can provide better performance for the applications that they're doing. Do you see them as potential investors um, in the process? Do you see them as, as part of the support staff? The the you know if nothing else the the cheering section in the background. Uh, certainly cheering section. We've been having, uh, we've had uh, major uh, people who've been cheering for some time and the whole community is in fact cheering us. The, the, as we've started to produce these videos, the reaction is it just completely flabbergasted us. Um, but um, it's a delicate trade uh, path to walk. Certainly they are, these folks are customers. Um, do they want to be an investment partner? Um, well, money's money, but on the other hand, you don't want to have the image of being in someone's pocket in the community. And um, this is a, a business decision that has to be walked rather carefully and will get settled on a path-by-path -path basis. I don't think we're any different than any other startup start in, in this respect. We are in conversations with several major companies, um, not for my own reasons, because we're an NDA to them, I can't talk about it, um, but we are, and we intend to continue so, and the right relationship and the right offer we'd take, um, it, it's, it, you have to look at the case. <laughs> well, well, let me ask, uh, you know, following Jeff Moore's crossing the chasm model, right, the, the early stage in this process, you pick a vertical and you go and attack that vertical. And you know, if you follow that formula, it's build 100% of the solution for a handful of companies. Uh, go out there and that gives you your identity. It allows you to triangulate your position in the market, leveraging their identity as a way of telling people, hey, the mill CPU can be used for this thing or that thing or this other thing over here. Um, do you have a sense for what those verticals might be early in the process? Well, I mentioned the, the, the research labs and um, the, the, the military um, scientific uh, world in general as a potential initial entry. Um, uh, there's a number of things which are in the embedded world. We would do a very good as the embedded processor for self-driving car, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but the critical component is these markets have to be small enough um, initially. I, I'm a great believer in the Walmart model. When Walmart started in Arkansas, they were in Podunk and everybody laughed at them. And they stayed in Podunk for 30 years, every little Podunk across the country, until they had built enough of, of volume that, and enough of a logistic chain to actually enter and compete where the Kmarts and uh, Macy's and so forth were in the suburbs. Um, I'm a great believer in this. I suspect that we will wind up in um, isolated niche markets, low-hanging fruit, um, until at a certain point uh, we've built the critical mass. Um, that's a business strategy, not a technology strategy. We could, we could go perfectly well into a blade server or a laptop tomorrow. Uh, well, not tomorrow. We still have to build the thing. <laughs> but um, we're certainly appropriate for that. Another strategy which we've considered is to make available development boxes 
presumably which we would produce ourselves or more likely have a Foxconn or somebody produce. Um, at essentially a loss leader zero price point and just offer them by the onesie, not in bulk, by the onesie off a website, keeping our costs as low as we possibly can and see what the educators, the hobbyists, the maker community as it is today would do with a mill in a box. Well, it's possible. That, that raises an interesting question because, you know, obviously crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, I should say, is, is huge right now, sort of all the buzz. Um, you've got Kickstarter projects that are pulling down 10, 12, 15 million dollars. Um, is there a play for mill? There is. Um, we wouldn't have thought so a year ago. We didn't think so a year ago. We looked at it. But the reaction to our initial splash has said, yeah, there is a possibility there. We're currently looking at it. Uh, there may, in fact, be a, a, a Kickstarter um, a plan afoot. Um, not yet finally decided whether it will be done. It's it's not as easy as saying, well, I'm going to make a video or a, a, a hit record and uh, you can, uh, as your reward, is we'll send you the record or the video. This, we're not going to have something to send for a couple of years and well, we can give them a t-shirt. It's not clear, uh, even if we had something with pins on the bottom, uh, what would a Kickstarter person do with this without the box to put it in and everything else? Um, so we've actually been kicking around a bunch of ideas as to how to structure it because we're not, the, the nature of the product is it, it's not the most obvious Kickstarter play. Uh, 